Once again, thank you for joining us. My name is Curtis Marshall with Procore. Uh, we are a firm that works with dentists to get them into a better financial position, and that's why we have invited you on to this webinar tonight. Uh, as we get going, uh, we prepare this information uh, not only to benefit you as a doctor, but also to benefit your financial position. So we've invited two CFOs along on this call. Along this call, it, uh, also on this call is Rob Bay, who's a port partner here at Procore. Uh, I have, in addition, I've also emailed all of you personally. Some of you I found on the web. Others, it was a little hard to locate you on the web. Uh, so, but that's a that's for a whole nother uh, that's for a whole nother webinar. Unfortunately, we're not going to be talking about how to find each other on the web. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed that email, and if you do have questions, feel free to email me at any time at curtis at procorecpa.com. Um, but I enjoy looking at everybody's information. You have some great uh, content out there. I notice some of you are general dentists. Other, you, uh, other of you are orthodontists or specialists. Um, we, uh, some, of, some of you have two staff members. Others have multiple practices. Uh, but no matter what your situation is, from this webinar, you will gain priceless content. Uh, and if you act on those principles, I promise you will get to a better financial position. So uh, with that in mind, get your pens and paper out and prepare to be wowed. Uh, first off, I want to introduce to you the amazing Rob Bay. Uh, if you've been on my previous webinars, you have heard him and known that he loves numbers. Uh, Rob, you here with us? Yeah, Curtis. Uh... Thanks. I'm I'm excited to talk about this topic. You know, it's really all centered around numbers, the numbers in dentistry. Um, you know, those little hidden things that you can find in your financial information in your practice management system that that really can be the key to you having a successful practice. So I'm I'm excited to be talking about some of these things. Awesome. Uh, us too. So tell us real quick. Uh, real brief, so, so we can jump into this, but tell us about Procore, what Procore does for the dentist. Sure, yeah, Procore is a firm that works with dentists nationwide. Uh, we work in uh, all 50 states, and, and really we help dentists to be proactive and use financial information as well as practice-related data um, to put the, the, the dentist in the best possible financial position. Most most dentists are not really optimizing their the potential of their practice, so we help implement a, a plan, a roadmap, a strategy, I guess, whatever you want to call it, to help them to, to do that. And uh, literally, our, our dentists are putting tens of thousands of dollars more uh, in their pocket. Um, so it's, it's pretty fun. It's exciting. That is, a, that is exciting. I hope uh, some of you out there got a smile on your face if you're wanting to, uh, that extra cash and also that peace of mind. Uh, next, we have a dental CFO consultant. Uh, if you haven't heard of one of those before, uh, that is somebody who consults uh, dental offices as a CFO uh, from the Procore team. Uh, his name is Adam Smith. Adam has an MBA uh, and loves the dental field. He's also known as Big Blue. Adam, are you here with us today? I am, Curtis. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I didn't tell Adam we'd be talking about Big Blue, but uh, tell us real quick, why are you known as Big Blue? Well, I was the mascot at my university. I did gymnastics for several years and decided I'd, I'd use it to uh, put it to good use when I was in college and became the mascot for the university. And my way through school doing that. Great. So for those out there, uh, all of our attendees, uh, feel free to ask me any questions on your chat. And if you're able to tell me what university uh, Big Blue would be attending, uh, I'll send you out an ebook. So feel free to message me and uh, I'll get that to you. Also, if you have additional questions at any time throughout this uh, webinar, feel free to message me and I will get it to you as well. And then uh, last but not least, we do have Steve James from Mortensen Family Dental. Uh, yes, he does, uh, Steve James, the two first names. Uh, but he is, uh, had, they have dental offices throughout the United States. And C, uh, Steve is the CFO for, for that uh, company, Mortensen Family Dental. Uh, but he's also been a CFO for other heathen industries, or what I mean by that is not dental. And so, uh, Steve, uh, glad to have you on with us today. Why? Why is it that you uh, jumped to the dental 
field and became a CFO in the dental field. Well, uh, thanks, thanks for the invite, Curtis. I, uh, I, I think that from, from my perspective, I, I've always had an affinity for dentistry. And uh, years ago, I hate to admit how old I am, but uh, I've been a, a practicing CPA for about 26 years now. And um, early on in my career, I had uh, uh, an experience with uh, uh, adult orthodonture that really changed my life and my outlook um, on uh, uh, on myself, and, and really kind of was was kind of one of the uh, propellers to some of the success in my career. So uh, back in those days, there really weren't group practices, um, but. Uh, I'd always wanted to associate, be associated with a group dental practice because I thought that uh, this did some wonderful things. And uh, I was fortunate that in the middle 90s I met uh, a group of dentists that uh, ultimately chose to form uh, what is now Mortenson Family Dental, which is uh, uh, a rather large group dental practice that uh, is based in 11 states. So I, I've been quite blessed and as, as, as my family. That's awesome. Thanks, thanks, Steve. And um, this is Rob back here, everybody. And I've had a chance to get to know Steve a little bit uh, over the last little while. We've had some conversations, and one thing that that he didn't tell you that uh, that that I'll tell you and and, and point out to you is Steve uh, actually recently was named CFO of, of the year uh, within his within his community. So I've got a little article. You can see a, see a picture of him here. Um, so he's somebody definitely that has a lot, a lot of uh, knowledge and experience uh, within the community. So thank you again very much, Steve, for coming on and and helping us uh, with with this discussion related to CFOs. Well, I appreciate that. Well, um, first I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what what is a, a CFO. I mean, what. What is it really that a CFO does, and 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 what's a CFO? So um, Adam and and Steve, I really just wanted this to kind of be a little bit of a of a discussion about what are what are the what is it that really a CPO is, and 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 what do they what do they do? Not necessarily for dentists, but just just in general. Uh, Steve, you were uh, you've been a CFO for for quite a while, not only for for, for Mortensen, but but prior. Um, how would you define that? What what is a CFO? Well, I I, I think that uh, the CFO the, the the best way I would sum up is is the financial advocate and financial steward of of your your business. And I think that before you define a CFO, you you really have to define the difference between uh, a CFO and a controller. I think that most folks um, there are, are not as knowledgeable of the financial side of the business in terms of the roles of, 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 of those folks. Um, frequently, they, um, uh, they, they, they don't completely understand that, that the CFO and the controller are really fairly two distinct roles. In a lot of smaller organizations, uh, those, those roles can be, um, they can be codependent. And I would submit to you that a lot of CFOs can act as controllers but I'm not so sure that so all controllers can act as CFO. And, and I'll explain that in that um, the role of a controller uh, or controller, uh, as, as other folks are called, is that's a person that is, is, is really the um, financial protectorate of, of the practice, the, the, the custodian of the, of the assets. And it's, it's their charge to make sure that everything is, is in its place each and every day. So the controller's job is to look at today and yesterday and make sure that everything as it, as it should be. Uh, conversely, a CFO, while it, the CFO is charged is, is to look at yesterday and today, um, most importantly, it's, it, the CFO's job is to look tomorrow. So I, I, the way I would sum it up is, is, is the CFO's primary job is, is to look forward and look outward in a business and, and, and be able to contemplate the, the next steps financially the business needs to take. Whereas the controller's job is, is a person that looks inward and says, here's make sure that we have everything we're supposed to do. But um, frequently a controller doesn't necessarily have the experience or the vision 
to be able to see what the next steps are ahead uh, for the businesses. Yeah, I really like that. I really like that definition. Um, uh, most dental practices uh, don't don't necessarily have uh, what you consider to be a controller, or a controller, or a CFO. Most of the time, a lot of this work is is left to themselves, or they may have an accountant, um, you know, or maybe a CPA who's helping them with something here or there. But there, it's it's really a a distinct role, and I and I love how you're talking about forecasting out to the future and, and really how that helps them helps them make make decisions you talked about uh, from the from the financial aspect Adam um, from from your perspective what how would you define um, the, the way that you look at uh, you look at, at being a CFO or what might uh, you add to what you add yeah I'll uh I'll actually just echo a lot of what Steve said. Steve, I really liked what you said, and and that it has to be looking forward. It can't just be okay. What happened? Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people that can do that, but a CFO is someone who works hand in hand with the owner as the owner develops a vision, or the CEO, if you want to call it a CEO, uh, develops a vision, and the CFO helps the owner understand the the best financial strategy to get there and what the effect of those decisions are going to be on the bottom line and on the financials of the practice. Thanks Adam. You know and uh, and Steve you'd mentioned you'd mentioned before I'm gonna I'm gonna skip ahead and we'll then we'll come back how a CFO is is different. Um, you know from a, the dentist perspective um, the Comptroller or, or CFO may be something that's a little bit foreign, but uh, some of the things that they uh, that they are familiar with would be a practice management consultant, a CPA, or an accountant. Um, so uh, I'm interested in just in some discussion about how maybe a, a CFO would be would be different than than any of these people. Steve, you'd mentioned before um, in your introduction that you were. You're a, you were a CPA. Um, how would you say that a CFO would be different from a from a CPA? Well, I, I think that well, um, I, 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 this is probably something is, is to to your group's advantage that you guys work so um, uh, intensively with the dental industry, which is quite a uniqueness. Um, most CPAs really don't have the industry expertise. Uh, I really have the, the background to understand the, um, uh, the hot buttons that make your business go. Um, I, I would submit they also probably don't know the intricacies of how a dental practice works most efficiently. Um, uh, a CFO, uh, or in this case a, a contract CFO, I, I think because they have a higher level of practical business acumen, I think that they're going to probably be a more effective uh, uh, resource for you in terms of how you manage the the, the financial side of your business. Um, um, so that's probably my distinction from a CPA. In, in terms yeah, of most things. most times, you know, people when they're at least from the the dentist that I talk to every single day. Their, their CPA gets involved strictly from a, from a tax perspective, and while many many of their CPAs may have uh, the ability or the education to be able to to help them with these types of things, it's really not the business model of of uh, of the CPA. You know, their their business is about telling what happened or compliance. Um, you know, filing filing tax returns uh, rather than rather than helping to project and 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 make good. Business decisions, and you know, I would one more time. Rare, they know much about dentistry. Um, yeah, uh, that's where you guys are a bit of an anomaly. I, that uh, uh, there's not really that many practice groups across the country that have enough concentration of dental groups that they really understand the intricacies of how a dental practice works most successfully. Yeah, and there, and while even there's some CPAs out there that specialize in working in in dentistry, and there's more out there than 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 solely our firm, a lot of those firms as well. Their focus really is around 
is around taxation, around tax, rather than just overall improving the financial position of, of the dentist. Um, one, uh, the, the terminology, you know, that uh, when we're talking about improving the business that people uh, or dentists are, are, are likely most familiar with is, is practice management consultants. Um, Adam, what the, from, from your perspective, how would you say a CFO would be different from, from what a practice management consultant would do? Uh, that's, that's actually a really good question, Rob. Uh, practice management consultants, uh, you, can, you can think of them more as uh, focusing on the human, human resources and the entire experience of the practice, um, the, more the feelings that people get as they associate with the practice. Uh, very rarely, and I know it does happen, but uh, for, for the majority, practice management consultants are not diving into your financial ratios and and really picking those apart and seeing uh, what things are, are contributing to, to certain numbers in your financials uh, and looking, comparing those with benchmarks. Uh, they, they kind of have a, this is, uh, this is the way that people like to be dealt with. This is the way that uh, I've seen successful practices run. You should try this. You should try these types of things. You should implement these. Uh, and uh, a lot of times there's no, uh, there's no strategy on how those effects that, uh, that they're looking for are going to uh, really affect the bottom line. Uh, so. The, the way that a CFO is, is different than a practice management consultant is a uh, practice management consultant works from uh, the inner dealings of the practice and really hopes that it's going to affect the bottom line like it has with several of their other practices. And a CFO looks from uh, the bottom line or the financials and uh, looks at the things that play into each of those. and understands exactly how certain changes will affect the bottom line. Yeah, I, I might add to that. I, I, I think that's absolutely spot on. Uh, one of the things that I found, and I've worked with a number of practice management so, uh, consultants over the years and, and still do, um, uh, most of them are, are particularly good at the, the human capital side of the business. They're particularly good at understanding the operational side of the business, the throughput of dentistry, um, and they're also usually reasonably good at the marketing side of the business. I would submit to you that uh, the, the vast majority of them are healthcare professionals, and as a result of that, they don't generally have a slant to the business of dentistry from a, just from a pure dollars and cents standpoint. And I think that the, one of the things that I've come to find about dentistry that is part of the reason why I love it is that dentistry across just about every section, uh, demographic section I've ever found, is statistically relevant. So I would submit to you, and I've got a lot of data that supports this, that I could tell you within reason um, uh, what a practice could be doing and should be doing just based on the patient mix, based on the procedure code mix. I, I think that you can do wonderful modeling with uh, the clinical data that you have in terms of looking at the practice potential and, and, and doing that. And while I've, I've talked to a number of consultants that see the opportunity, very few of them can really translate that into legitimate financial terms. And I think a CFO that understands dentistry can do that. Yeah, I would agree completely with that. You know, a CFO is used to looking at searching for, analyzing information to find meaning and, that, and from that meaning uh, help bring about action. And that's, and that's really what we're, what we're talking about today. That's really the meat of what we, what we wanted to get to. Um, you know, in, in general, uh, as, we, as we mentioned before, a dentist is taking this on themselves. They are, uh, not only are they the clinician, but they're the entrepreneur. They're the ones who are setting the vision. They're the ones who are trying to, uh, when I say they, I mean you who are listening, are, are the ones who are trying to figure out, you know, how do I make this business successful? And so it, it really brings about 
the question of why a dentist would want or why a dentist would would need a CFO. Um, we all know that dentists get an incredible amount of uh, of business schooling uh, when when they go through school. Uh, I think that uh, that they get uh, you know a, a semester, um, and but they're thrown into a role where uh, they're business owners and and dealing with dealing with all these types of things. Um, so I, I think it I think it's a, a little bit obvious about why a dentist might might need a CFO um, to be able to to help them to be more effective and, and more efficient and make make good decisions. Um, I, I want to talk uh, really about three main areas about um, what a what a CFO uh, would would do for a dentist. And and a CFO can can do can do more than these things, but these are the really three main things that I wanted to focus on today with this webinar. Uh, number one is is they help to analyze financial information, um, you know, make meaning from that information, uh, and then and then bring about what is it that we're going to going to do about it. Second is they help determine and measure uh, key performance indicators. Steve, you you started to mention and talk about looking at key practice data and that can tell you what kind of potential a practice has and so this for you listening this these are the types of things that that we're talking about and the third thing is a CFO can help it to help dentists make critical decisions and uh, and so I've, I've kind of broken these out into some some examples under under each of these under each of these categories and uh, want to talk a little bit about about uh, each each of these uh, areas and categories, and maybe share some examples that that we've come across uh, in in these areas. So under under the uh, area of, of analyze financial information, um, the the first the first thing really that comes to my mind is is cash flow. Um, now, m cash flow. When we're talking about cash flow, uh, most dentists when they think of cash flow uh, and the way that they measure it is uh, looking at the amount of money that they have in their bank account right now. Um, so let's get a, uh, Steve or, or Adam, uh, any, any thoughts about how a CFO can, can help a dentist in relation to uh, understanding cash flow? Yeah, I Are you can, there, I Adam? Take, yeah, I can okay. take that one. Great. Uh, I don't know if you, you said Steve or Adam. I didn't know which one you wanted. Um, oh, sure. So, so uh, I can I can think of a specific situation. So we analyze all sorts of different ratios, and and one key ratio that that's pretty standard in the industry is the current ratio, and that's the ability of your your current assets to cover your current liabilities. Uh, what we notice is most dentists aren't, aren't paying attention to that. Like Rob said, they're just paying attention to what's in the bank account. And I, I had a, a particular client that approached me. Uh, we had just engaged to, to start working with them. And uh, she approached me and said, you know, I my business keeps doing worse and worse. Uh, I can't figure out what's going on. Uh, I've put all of this effort in and, and invested all of this money. And I, I'm not getting any return on it. And we went through her financials, and it turned out that her current ratio was about 1.1, meaning uh, if there was a month with particularly high um, costs, she was not going to be able to cover those in that month if she had uh, spent money from previous months. Uh, so what we identified is... Hey, Adam, her, why don't you explain what that quick ratio is, and then, okay. and then a little so, bit about maybe where that, what, what that means and where it should be. Okay, so, so the current ratio is uh, your current assets, which are, are classified as any assets that can be quickly converted into cash. Uh, in dentistry, generally, that's uh, your checking and savings accounts. Um, there, there are a couple other things that play into that if you have some inventory, um, uh, but particularly those checking and savings accounts. And then your, uh, it's the ability of those current assets to cover your current liabilities, meaning uh, anything that's going to come due within a year is your, your current liabilities. 
And when that's just above one, that means that all of the current assets you're earning for the year are barely going to cover uh, your current liabilities. And uh, like I said, hers was, was particularly close to one, and she had had several months where she actually had to take uh, dip into a line of credit to, to cover some expenses. And uh, what we identified, and uh, like I said, this was uh, fairly uh, close to right when she came on, uh, through our first financial analysis, was that uh, her accounts receivable, without her knowledge, had creeped up to 145 days, which is uh, really, really high, obviously. Uh, and so, you know, there there was over four hundred thousand dollars in accounts receivable, and I, I started prodding into what had happened. And she had terminated the person in charge of accounts receivable, uh, and the billings weren't being handled correctly, and really weren't really being done at all. Uh, so we hired a company to come in. She didn't have to bring on a, a full time person to do it. We hired a company to come in at a, a certain percentage of what they collected, and uh, over the past three months since we've been focusing on that, her uh, her net income for each of those months has been over 40000 uh, and her current ratio is now up to 1.7. She said she hasn't had any cash flow issues since she started focusing on it. Where, you know, you say 1.7, where, if a, a dentist is going to go look this up, and see what their current ratio is, um, because I'm guessing it's not something that's normally on the top of their mind. Where should that number be? Uh, you mean in what range should it be? Yeah, yeah. Uh, comfortably, uh, right around two. You know, it, it depends uh, also on the size of the practice, uh, and, and a lot of different things play into that. But for uh, a normal practice with uh, you know one or two dentists. Uh, right around two would uh, generally be a comfortable range for that person to be in. Great, awesome, thanks, thanks, Adam. So I, you know, I'd encourage any of you who are who are here and listening to uh, uh, to go look that up and find out uh, find out where your your current ratio is. Um, it's it's a key a key thing to uh, to look at and a key thing to know with, within your practice. And um, you can find those things on the balance sheet uh, if anyone's wondering if you, if you pull up your balance sheet, it'll have a, a category for current assets and a category for current liabilities. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. I was going to add to that. I, I, I think that certainly one of the things that uh, interesting, uh, so we, we, we monitor actively at Mortensen a number of key ratios. And we have target ratios that we monitor our, our performance against. And interestingly enough, that I'm just looking at the, the, the key barometers that we use every month. And, and our target ratio for a quick ratio or current ratio is 1.9 to 1, which is obviously close to the 2 to 1 that you were describing. One of the things that we do um, is we monitor the cash ratio, which is our ability with just our free cash flow to manage our current liabilities. And, and we have a target that's not obviously quite uh, one, 2 to 1, but we'd like that number to be as close to 1 to 1 as possible. And as we see that number dwindling with the current ratio going up, we know that that typically is going to be a translation to um, our receivable turns slowing down, that we have a collection problem. And I think to Adam's point, I think that's one of the things that just over the years I've seen that most dental practices do a very poor job is just managing their outstanding receivables. Um, that frequently you find they have a sufficient amount of um, of assets, they're just not liquid enough. And so over time, one of the terms that we use here at Mortensen that we're very, very attuned in is what we call DSO, or day sales outstanding. So we're trying to monitor actively those receivable days and keep them as low as possible. And, and quite honestly, because the insurance companies actually, through electronic claims and so forth, and if you actually collect the desk properly when the service is rendered, which I know a lot of clinicians don't do as good a job as they like. Uh, we found that you can you can reasonably expect that your receivable days could be lower than than 15 days. And I think that a lot of things people that think that's impossible, but I'm here to tell you at Mortensen, our DSO is 12, um, and simply because we over time 
actively monitored the collection of receivables and, and worked extremely diligent in making great financial arrangements at the desk. And, and it's proven to become one of our financial strengths because we don't, and even with that said, we still send, just like everybody else, we send a lot of statements out, but that's something that we're constantly working on because that's a huge hidden cost in every business is the cost of just collecting those dollars. Yeah, accounts, accounts receivable is, I mean, we, uh, Adam and I, as well as multiple others today, had a, a fairly lengthy discussion as we're talking about uh, accounts receivable and, and the, really the uh, the noose or the anchor that it puts around uh, around the leg of a of a dentist if it's something that they don't have under under control so so cash flow is something that uh, that your CFO can can help you to uh, to look at and and, and analyze and another so one problem. is uh, yeah one go ahead. additional thing to add to that is a, a lot of the the way that a lot of practices are set up if you're paying off of production uh, you've already paid all of the costs on everything that's sitting in accounts receivable, meaning that's money that should be going right to the bottom line. You, no matter whether you collect or not on a, a procedure, you, you use the materials to go to that procedure. And if you're paying any associates or or anyone that's working on the patient off of production, uh, whether or not that money comes in, you incur those expenses. And that's the way that... Uh, this particular client was was set up as she paid off of production and uh, so so she was having major issues because she paid and wasn't being paid on on those productions so well, yeah and that leads us into uh, into talking about looking at and analyzing wages um, you know we have some key numbers that we look at as it relates to wages that uh, overall uh, your wages out, outside of your dentist should be uh, twenty percent or less uh, than your than of your total collections. Also, as it relates to um, hygiene, and this this is one as as, as well uh, when uh, uh, we look at this number that a lot of times this this is something that's uh, that's not in line. But uh, your your hygienist wages um, should be somewhere in the ballpark of thirty uh, percent or a third. Um, of, of the the total production or collections from from hygiene, uh, I got those right, Adam. Yeah, yeah, you have those right. Uh, usually, we try to go anywhere from twenty five to thirty two percent on those on those wages of production. I would agree what uh, what do you see, Steve, or where are you, where are you guys uh, where are you guys benchmark for? We're benchmarked basically from between 24 and 33, depending on where we are in the country. Uh, obviously, if we're, we're sitting in uh, Utah or Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where there's a, just a, a great deal of a number of hygienists, uh, we can be a little bit more we can be a little bit more uh, uh, cost effective on, on on salaries for both dentists and hygienists in terms of the commission rate we pay. Whereas if we were in uh, you know uh, let's say West Texas, where where it's a little bit more challenging to find those folks, we're going to pay a little bit higher commission rate. But um, the one thing that we do, uh, and I just I believe in passionately, is that uh, uh, everything we do is we pay it off collections, um, and that's one way to control those costs. And um, one of the things that we've gone into over time, and I know this might be a bit controversial, is we believe in the concept of open book management. That um, if if you share your books with 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 your team with the exception of payroll cost, that you're going to find that uh, um, perhaps your staff will get into the ownership uh, of uh, of the profitability of your practice. And uh, I know that's been a bit controversial, but uh, uh, I, I I guess not to be boastful, but uh, there's there's a bonus system that that I help create um, that. Uh, has been bantered around in some consulting things across the country called PSLM, and we've been doing that successfully now for about a decade. And uh, I, I would challenge most folks to, uh, to find out what on the system has been able to sustain the, the, the passage of time um, that's still based off of some level of profitability for the dentist where everybody wins. Yeah, any, any time when you can uh, align the, your employees' goals with with your own. That's 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 a win-win, um, and so I, I I definitely think that that's that's a great a great thing great thing to look at. 
So a CFO can help you in looking at and analyzing where you're at and where you should be and if you should be expecting more or uh, a lot of times you hear from your employees that they're, you know, they're working as hard as they can or they feel overworked and uh, this, this is a way really for you to get a good gauge and an idea of whether that's the, that's the case or they, they just have become accustomed to their workload and now for some reason it, it's increasing. Um, and the, the second area, that area that we were talking about or that I want to talk about that a CFO can help you with is determining and, and measuring uh, KPIs, key performance indicators. These are, these are the things within your practice um, that when, if you, that are either contributing to your success currently or will help to uh, augment your success. Um, you know, and, and uh, when Steve had mentioned earlier, by looking at some key statistics, he can see what the potential is of a practice. He, he, like, he likely then knows from there, these are the areas or these are the things that we need to focus on and measure um, because the things that you measure ultimately you focus on and those things improve um, to be able to get to that area or get to that potential. Um, so determining what, what those things are, uh, there's, there's definitely some, some art and some science that goes into probably more, more, more science than art in looking at those numbers, figuring out what it is that's going to, going to help your practice to be able to be able to be more successful. So I want to talk about a, a couple, uh, a couple key uh, key performance indicators. Um, one of them uh, is production per patient visit. Um, you know that's that's a key performance indicator that that your your CFO may uh, may look at and say this is this is a key statistic that we need to be watching and measuring. Uh, and, and then from there, it needs to be determined what are the things that are contributing uh, to this to this statistic. Um, Adam, you were telling me here just recently about uh, a situation that you were working uh, working with a dentist on this particular uh, KPI. You want to share with us um, a little bit about that story and, and and maybe what some of the contributing factors were to to help improve this KPI and and where we should where we should be seeing this KPI? Yeah, uh, so so this particular client is, is one who had a, a very large patient base, and, and like Steve said, uh, uh, when you see these numbers come in, a lot of times, just from a few different numbers, you can see where the practice should be, and, and to give you a good idea of where this practice should be, uh, at this size of a patient base, he should have been collecting around $1.6 million a year. Uh, and his collections for the, the 2012, the year into 2012, uh, were just over 700,000. Uh, so automatically where, where my mind went was, okay, what's, what's going on with his production per patient visit? Obviously he's having a lot of patient visits. Uh, what's going on with the production there? Uh, so we took an average. We actually just took the average from his best month ever, which he had uh, in July. And his average was just over 200, uh, which uh, what we have seen as an industry-wide standard is about $300 production per visit, uh, which uh, basically is a good mix of uh, dental work uh, actual work that the dentist is doing and hygiene. Uh, so essentially, you know, we have we have several of our practices whose hygiene departments were producing more per visit than uh, this practice in total. And so uh, I, I spoke with the owner of the practice and just kind of picked his brain about what he was doing as far as case presenting went and uh, set a few things in place that uh, that he could make sure he was doing every time he was presenting treatment to a patient. And uh, over the last month, uh, his average since our, our appointment has been 267. Uh, so at his patient base, that adds uh, over $200,000 to his collections for the year. Uh, and you know that, that's one thing that we de definitely need to be focusing on because uh, you can Feel, and we say this all the time at our firm, 
being busy doesn't mean you're being productive. Although you feel like you've been had a productive day, uh, you can be really busy and uh, very busy like this practice was and uh, only bill out $3,000 to the insurance. Well, and uh, you know, like like you said, that that increase to them was about two hundred thousand dollars. That will equate to this this year, and that's without bringing any additional costs. Um, are there any additional costs that came about in 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 bringing in getting that extra production? Well, uh, if if you think that additional cases are going to be accepted, then there will be some costs of of lab fees and and other things associated with that. But uh, other than that, um, no, I mean, you're not going to have to pay additional hygienists or, or anything like that. So uh, a large percentage of that, then, is able to, to go to go directly to the dentist by focusing on and improving this statistic. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty key statistic. It's, uh, you know, one of, one of many things. Uh, there's uh, uh, I mean, we have a, a product that we call Dental Intel that helps bring about and, and, and boils up to the top the most important statistics for your particular practice. But there's another uh, software out there I'm familiar with, and uh, they have 390 plus KPIs uh, in your in your that it, that it can demonstrate or, or show to you. And really, it's a matter of knowing which KPIs are the most important, because there's no way possible, really, to look at or measure 390 statistics. Um, you know, once you once you get beyond 10 or 12, you're you're beyond your capacity to uh, to monitor monitor it appropriately, and and then really do anything about it. So finding a, finding the KPIs or the the key performance indicators that are most critical to your particular situation uh, is, is an important important aspect. Um, one that we regularly find as well uh, ends up being a, a, a key statistic is, is this uh, idea of pre-appointment. And uh, Steve, I don't know if this is something that you guys look at or, or you measure within your practice, but the way that we go about doing this is, is we measure how many patients uh, do you patient visits do you have scheduled in the future from today forward? And then we divide that by how many active patients you have, meaning those that you've seen in the last 18 months, and that gives you a number. Uh, we, we regularly like to ask dentists um, where they think they are uh, in relation to this statistic, and um, they typically say somewhere in the ballpark of 60 to 70 percent, and I think I think Adam, that uh, that you told me that you you've never had anybody tell you less than sixty percent. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't ever had anyone come in below sixty percent, and I've actually had people come in as high as one hundred percent. So, well, the uh, the average that we find in in looking at this is somewhere in the low the low thirty percent, um, and we have a, a benchmark that we shoot for of of, of trying to get this number to to eighty percent um, but uh, so, so many practices are focused so focused on bringing in new patients um, that they're not as focused on what they're doing with with their current patients and they're and they're just ending up falling up off uh, you know out, out, out the back door well, so uh, so this is I was going to say it, it, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more with that that's actually a point of emphasis. Um, we, we, what we do is we call uh, we have active reactivation campaigns going on. I, mm -hmm. I think this is falsity of dentistry um, and that we all fall in love with the new patients and we fall out of love with the patients we have. And what what we found is just exactly what you said is that in all our practices, everybody thinks that the reappointment rate and the retention rate of their patients is really good. But they, what we found is that. I mean, it's 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 basically anywhere from 25 to 40 percent, but it's rarely better than 40 percent. And yet, that's the that, that's the low hanging fruit. Those are the people that have actually seen you and have some affinity for you, but you um, uh, you you might not even done the simplest thing, which is reappoint. And I, I think that um, that one thing alone, uh, I would submit to you that uh, anybody that's listening on the phone. If you think that you have a hundred percent reappointment rate, 
um, you should get the gold star because I will tell you I've seen hundreds and hundreds of practices in the last year, and I've yet to find one that's got 100 percent. Everybody thinks they're doing it, but they're not. And and what we found was is that in a lot of cases, even in our own practices, which we're doing extremely well, that this is just the most easy low hanging fruit we have in terms of simply reappointing the patient and asking them to come back. So we spend all these dollars to get them to walk through the door, and we don't even do the simplest thing to keep them as patients. Um, uh, so I, I think that's, 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 a, that's a major takeaway I would strongly suggest. Um, and, and to your point, guys, I think the KPIs kind of pop those things out. Um, and uh, anyway. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with what what you're saying. This this is a very key uh, statistic, and it's it's one that regularly surfaces. And there's really four interactions um, that affect this statistic. And so when this ends up being an issue, which a lot of times it does, this pre-appointment uh, percentage, um, we start looking at four different types of interactions. And those interactions are. What do you do when the patient is in your office and rescheduling them? Second, how do you handle uh, situations when people call to cancel? Third, what do you do to be able to remind people of their appointments? Uh, and then fourth, what type of uh, reactivation or, or uh, recall efforts uh, do you have, whether by electronic means or, or by, by human means? I mean, those really are the four, the four key types of interactions that affect this statistic. So I, I would encourage uh, anybody listening to go find this statistic, find out how many appointments you have scheduled in the future, how many active uh, patients that, that you have, um, and then that's going to give you a percentage. And uh, if, if you're like what uh, Steve is saying and what we're finding, that you're, you're somewhere in the, in the ballpark of mid-20s to 40%, um, there's a lot that you can do. That tells me there's a lot that you can do to improve your financial position without even bringing on uh, a single new patient. So start to measure that number. If it comes back to you and, and you have uh, a thousand active patients and you've got 320 that have a scheduled appointment, start measuring that number, 320. And know today that you're going to see however many patients you're, you're going to see, so that number is, gonna, is going to diminish. Uh, and so you need to replace those and more to continually bring that number up from 320 uh, to bring it forward to 330 or 370 or to 400 or to 500 or or to 600. Um, Adam, you you told me about uh, a situation where you were dealing with this this one particular issue and uh, the results that came about by by focusing on it um, with this being a, a major issue in that practice by focusing on it uh, and, and what happened. Do you mind sharing that with everybody on here? Yeah, so, so this practice came in uh, actually pretty average for where we see practices coming in, right about 28%. Uh, and we started looking at it and really focusing on it. And, and Steve, I actually wanted to ask you, do you, do you know the, the cost to your practice of replacing a patient? Oh yeah, it's about a hundred dollars a patient um, right. for us, and, uh, and and that's probably better than most people. What what I generally find with the practices that I'm working with is uh, they're generally spending every almost everything that they produce in the first appointment uh, to to get a new patient to replace a patient that walks out without a visit. Uh, so, so this particular practice, like I said, came in about 28%. Uh, we put a couple of procedures in place to make sure that uh, the proper communication was happening at each handoff and uh, that the patient was uh, never just being left by themselves to, to walk up to the front and you know, several other things that, uh, as far as verbiage goes, uh, to, to make sure that we were driving that, uh, that number up and that no one was leaving without a pre-appointment percentage, and over the course of uh, one month, they increased 10%, uh, and in the two months following, uh, they got that, that percentage up to 45%. Uh, just to give you an idea of that, that was our focus for, for those months was 
was getting those up. And, uh, and the effect that that had was uh, that June was the highest month they had ever have ever had uh, by fourteen thousand dollars without doing anything on on case presentation or production per visit uh, that their schedule was was so full that they uh, their collections for that month month were fourteen thousand higher than any other month they'd had in the past. Yeah, Adam. One thing I might suggest is something else that we found that's sort of along the same lines as just what you described. Is what we found is that um, um, more often than not, our practices have capacity, and if there's a willingness to say yes to the practice and do same day dentistry, because that's what the patient may, if they're willing, you should do it. We found that to be the most profitable form of dentistry that can be done, um, and I, I think that that's. That's usually low hanging fruit in most practices because I think it's just a mentality to reappoint, and yet that, that's probably not what the patient wants to do because I think that the reality is, whether we like it or not, uh, as the patient's walking towards the door, the other priorities of what's in their life usually usurps dentistry, and that's the reason why we don't get those patients back. So if the opportunity exists to do the dentistry now uh, or in very, very, very short terms, we need to do it. Definitely, I can I can see how that'll be that would be really important. Uh, we we had been tracking with with one of our practices. This just kind of reminded me of that. Uh, their continuing care uh, pre appointment percentage was over eighty, but for the entire practice they were at forty. And what we had uh, what we had come to the conclusion was that this particular practice uh, did over two thousand treatment plans per year, and uh, what we, what we boiled it down to is uh, the doctor said on, a, on his good days, uh, he's at about 60% case acceptance. Uh, and so uh, basically what I pointed out is, OK, that's uh, essentially 1,200 uh, patients who are saying yes and 800 who are, are saying no. And uh, of, those, of those 800, now they're leaving. Uh, they've got an appointment scheduled for hygiene, possibly, depending on how it's scheduled in the practice. Uh, but uh, th they're leaving, saying, no, I'm not going to get that treatment you just recommended for me. Now when that patient gets home, uh, because the same-day treatment wasn't done, the, when that patient gets home and their hygiene appointment starts to approach, they've got a couple of different things going through their head. Number one, he's, I'm embarrassed that I needed treatment and I said no. Or number two, I still don't, I still am not in a position to accept that treatment, and I feel like they're going to push me into trying to get it if I go to that appointment. And that led to almost six cancellations per day on average when they came in on their hygiene department. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, it, was, it was very strongly correlated as far as their number of cancellations and, uh, and their number of treatment plans. And uh, I think that, that speaks a lot to being able to do same-day dentistry and, and get them in when the need has been created uh, and not giving them the chance to say no and then become embarrassed and then cancel and not uh, come back to the practice. Thanks, thanks, you guys. And I think really the key for those that are, you know, following along at, at home is, is have this be something that you measure, um, have this be something that, that you look at. And th these are the types of things, again, that uh, that in, in having a CFO or having somebody who's looking for this type of thing uh, it, for your benefit will will find these things and help you focus on on the right things, which literally will put uh, tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars more more in your pocket. Well, we're we're getting uh, close on on time, and so uh, in this that last section we we're talking about helping make decisions, um, and, I've, and I've got, uh, I guess, four different things, and, and let's just talk about one of them, and so I'll, I'll let uh, you, Adam, and Steve, or uh, you know, whoever speaks up first, decide which of these we talk about, and um, uh, helping make decisions, I've got um, whether you open a new office or not, whether you decide to bring on an associate, uh, uh, whether or not you're going to sell your practice, or how you go about that. Or uh, what, or how to be able to uh, reinvest, or 
or make good decisions with your with your excess income. Any one of those stick out to either of you too? Steve, I spoke up last time, so why don't you why don't you choose this time? Give me the choices again, because I, I I think that well, gonna... open a open a new office, right. uh, whether to open a new office or not, whether to bring on an associate or not, um, whether to uh, sell your practice or or how to go about selling your practice, or uh, CFO can also help you to make good decisions whether uh, how you're going to invest your excess income or um, whether you're going to reinvest that income. Well, um, I, you know, I, I, the associates is a good one. New practice is one that that, that we deal with quite frequently. Uh, so, what's your preference there? Um, let's let's go then to uh, let's go then on to the one about uh, about about an associate. Um, you know, th this a lot of times is a is a struggle that practices come across. Um, a, a, a practice starts or is purchased. The dentist is doing well. They're working like crazy. They're they're starting to make good money, and uh, now all of a sudden they want to change their lifestyle, work less, spend more time recreating or or with with family. And they come to this decision of whether uh, can I bring on an associate? Can I not bring on an associate? Um, and and it's 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 an important decision. And uh, a lot of dentists have a hard time. Um, making this decision. And all of these things that, that, I, that I just mentioned are all things that uh, CFO's responsibility is helping you have good information to be able to make right decisions. They're not making decisions for you, the dentist, but are bringing about that information so you, you, you have everything available to you so you can make a good decision or, or, or make, make the right decision. What might be some of the things that uh, that you as a CFO, Steve, would look at or consider uh, for for a dental office that's uh, that's contemplating bringing on uh, a new associate. Well, I, I think there's several things that I would probably look at. I, I think that in terms, of, I would probably break the decisions the, the way you looked at it into two different options. One is is if. Uh, and we frequently deal with this where uh, a, a, a dentist has, has built their practice up and um, uh, they, uh, th they want to perhaps work a little bit less because they're getting comfortable with their lifestyle and they can be able to sustain the level of income they want to um, with their personal income. And, and one of the things that's unique about our group is, uh, and, and I don't know if most people know, but we're owned by dentists. We're just a, a, a large practice just like uh, the rest of you guys. We're just having to be a collection of a lot of dentists. But uh, the way we look at it is we make a distinction between the, the, the wage that I pay myself as a dentist uh, as opposed to the profits of the practice. And that's important when you're taking a look at the associates because we're going to say that our expectation, let's use a, a simple example, or let's say it's our expectation that the, the provider part of the practice can produce $100,000 a month. And uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, uh, in, in our case, in, in Louisville, we're paying 25% to our dentist. We're paying uh, $25,000 to that doc. And then what we're going to have is after everything's left over, after the doc's paid, we expect to make 20% profit. So. If it's a situation where the doc's wanting to cut back, we're going to say, listen, that's great that you want to cut back, but you still have to look at your practice as an investment and in terms of if you want to continue to get that 20% return um, on the practice or $20,000, you've got to bring us, you have to have a sufficient number of provider hours to, to, to serve the patient base because uh, contrary to what most of us believe, uh, patients generally have choices and um, uh, in terms of where they can seek care, so we have to we have to create access to care in the most consumer friendly manner as possible. So um, that's that's one method in terms of when we're choosing to bring on a, an associate doctor with with what we call a lead doctor. And in, in those situations, it's simply a matter do we have the ability to, to deal with the demands of the patient base. The other one, which is a, quite a bit more sophisticated process, is a situation of a growing practice, and this is this is a it's a combination 
of uh, what we'll call the patient encounters, uh, which would include the hygiene checkoffs as well, and the new patients. Um, one of the things that we found is that um, if a doctor is processing much more than 100 new patients a month over a sustained period of time, we think that the numbers, there's a diminishing return. Um, in fact, it's our opinion that most doctors in the sweet spot over long term um, optimally are handling somewhere in the range of, of 50 to 70 new patients a month. And if it gets much higher than that, we, we start looking to bring in a second doc in or a third doc or whatever that might be. Another thing that we start looking at, um, and this is, this, this is a little bit different approach, uh, but it has to do with more mature practices, is maybe perhaps the number of new patients isn't as high, but the, the, the practice is quite full with hygiene patients. And if the docs are checking off too many hygiene appointments per hour, that's also going to cut into their productivity. So that was actually an analysis I just did for our group recently. To your point, Adam, we were having situations where we had a number of our docs, and it's interesting to use the $300 number because that's our target as well, is a number of our docs were producing around 250 per hour. And the reason why the numbers were lower was simply because there was too many hygiene checks per hour, and it was cutting into the overall productivity of the doc. So we knew that the, that the, hygiene, uh, product, that the hygiene checks probably weren't doing as good a job with case presentation. And if we brought an associate doctor in there, we could simply redirect a lot of those patients, and in particular checks, that we could be doing more same-day conversions with those hygiene patients and actually fulfill an associate doctor and, and increase practice productivity. I think the one thing that I would strongly advise against all the dentists is if you don't bring an associate doctor in when, it, 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 when, when the practice is going down or, or a situation where I'm saying I think to be retiring, you, you need to be in a situation where the practice is progressively growing and, or a situation where you're simply willing to share. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to echo that, Steve. Oh. Uh, we we get a lot of people that come in and you know their their collections aren't where they want to be, and say maybe I need to bring on an associate so we can we can double up on the work, uh, but their patient flow won't uh, support an associate. Uh, I think along with what you said in those growth stages, uh, as you as you bring on those associates, uh, you need to make sure that the bottlenecks are uh, where they need to be. For for example, uh, if, if your bottleneck is your patient flow, obviously that's not where you want to be on bringing on an associate. Uh, we had a, a particular client who he came on, he w was right in all the ratios that we wanted him to be as far as profitability, and uh, he'd been working four and a half to five days a week, and said, you know, I need to spend time with my family now, I really need to cut back, and uh, his growth was, was almost enough to support an associate. Uh, so we started focusing on a couple of KPIs that would feed into that, uh, that patient flow. And then what we did is we built him to be the bottleneck, meaning uh, as those patients started coming in, we brought on an additional hygienist, uh, making sure that his profit was still where he wanted it to be. And as the hygienist came on, uh, his schedule started to fill up, so he became the bottleneck. And when we brought the associate on, uh, he never even had a decline in his take home. Uh, his take home actually went from, uh, well, his his take home for a year uh, was about 320 for the the prior year, and is projected to be about 540 this year because of uh, how we were able to build him up as the bottleneck. So making sure that you're not trying to use it as a way to uh, to become busier, but uh, as a way to handle the uh, the bottleneck that you've created for yourself and, and the demand for your time. Right. Another thing I was going to add, just so that I think you're spot on, uh, that, that we frequently look to do when we're looking to bring an associate on, is is, is perhaps allowing that lead doctor to, if they haven't already done so, maybe expand their skill set and do something. One of the things we frequently are advocating our docs to do, because we think it's a very profitable form of dentistry, as well as a, as a well-needed service, 
is, 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 is sedation ministry for those fear-based patients, which are typically much larger treatments. Um, they require a lot more uh, intensive work on the dentist part, so therefore there, there's not as much time for the being doing what, doing what the busyness of the practice, but that also allows the young associate to come in and fill that void. And, and frequently those, those fear-based patients, uh, because they're just much, much larger treatments, kind of fills the gap. Well, we uh, we're we're getting to getting to the point where we probably should uh, should wrap up, and I know we've we had a lot of other good things to talk about. Um, and, I, and thank you, both of you, Adam and Steve, for for your insight, for your knowledge. I hope you uh, who's watching this webinar have taken some notes on on some of the things that relate to you or pertain to you. That you found some statistics that you're going to start to look at and measure and and do something about. Um, you know, in in reality, a, a CFO can 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 do so much for for practice or for a business. Um, a lot of times, dentists say, you know, if I was a a hospital or a a large corporation or large business, you know, then then it would make sense to have have a CFO. Um, but dentists really can could benefit significantly from from having a, having a CFO. And it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody like uh, like Steve, you know, who's a full-time CFO within his group and within his organization. There's there's other options and 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 alternatives. So um, you know, I, I guess really uh, I, I want to uh, just get your everybody's final takeaway um, b before we get to the point of wrapping up and and uh, turning this back to Curtis. Um, Steve, if if you had one takeaway. From today, uh, what what would you say that it was your uh, your your main point or the the thing you'd take away from today? Well, I, I think again, uh, the one thing that uh, that I've learned over um, my years of experience, and this is even true for the small practitioner. Interestingly enough, I I, I before I was in uh, a full time CFO, I was actually a, a part time CFO, uh, similar to what Adams does. So I'm certainly a big advocate uh, of that role. So. Um, I think the key is is that um, you, uh, every practitioner needs to assemble their team of, of advisors. And while we, we, we understand there's a cost associated that, I think that um, uh, every business team needs, uh, 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 the dental professional needs to understand that they don't have to be all things to all people and that uh, the, the most successful business people surround themselves with people that complement uh, what makes their business most successful. And uh, I, I think that, to your point, if uh, um, uh, a part-time CFO does make a lot of sense uh, for a lot of, a lot of practices, uh, as well as a, as a good lawyer, a good banker, on a good CPA. Great takeaway. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Adam, how about how about you? What's your takeaway from today? Um, first of all, I just wanted to see, say, Steve, thanks thanks for being on. I, I like to see that uh, a lot of our ideas and our uh, our practices that we're doing are, are along the same line. Um, thanks. And if I were to take one one takeaway from today, and this is a combination of what we talked about today and and my experience is that. Uh, Numbers don't lie. When when it comes down to the bottom line, you, you can you can trick yourself all you want that the, that there there's not really a reason why the bottom line is not what you want it to be, uh, and and feelings can can sometimes be deceiving, but th there always is a reason why the bottom line ends up being what it is. Yep. Well said. Thanks, thanks, Adam. You know that uh, that you know that really really goes to uh, the point of a uh, situation that we were talking about uh, oh quite a while ago about sometimes we get in the in the point of of, of making emotional decisions um, and the latest thing that happened is what we feel is pervasive all throughout our our company and our, and our practice. Um, or what the, the the squeaky wheel brings forward, and but looking at the information, looking at the numbers, you know they they don't lie. They they tell the story. 
Um, my, my biggest takeaway really from today is the fact that uh, if, if you as a dentist out there are, are, are frustrated um, with what's going on with your practice, just know that, that there's improvement that can happen. And by finding and knowing uh, these key performance indicators, um, by you making good financial decisions and, and analyzing that information, whether that's something that you, you can do yourself or you, you have help uh, in, in doing that, by, by doing those things, it really can make a tremendous impact to your practice. Whether you're a practice that's uh, struggling financially and, and are, are wanting to get to a point where you feel like your head is above water, or you're a practice that's already very successful. Some of, our, uh, some of the clients that we come across that we have the greatest success with uh, a lot of times are, are practices that are already incredibly successful. Um, and by implementing and bringing about a few other a few other things, it, it, it takes that practice to the next level. So that's, I guess, really, really my my takeaway. Um, Curtis, you know, you you've been uh, listening to a lot of this a lot of this discussion. How, how about you? What what's your takeaway from today? Wow! Uh, if, I, if I can just say that, wow! And thank you to both. Uh, both of J uh, Steve James and also uh, Adam Smith, you guys were were amazing. Well, geez, a lot of them took my my thunder, which I was going to say. But the biggest takeaway I would say is we discuss so many things, and we want to discuss more. So for those that want a little bit extra, uh, want to know more about the subjects we are going to discuss, please uh, give me an email, or you can uh, text me. Uh, most of you should have my cell phone number. If not, I'll give it to you here in just a moment, uh, and I will send you out some more information. Uh, interesting enough, I had an, e uh, an office email me before this webinar, and she said something funny. She said, if I were a hospital, and just like you are talking about, Rob, if I were a hospital, I would need a CFO, but I'm a dental office, and I do not need one, nor can I afford one. And I think that's why a lot of people jumped on today is because they... Uh, uh, don't think that they could or didn't know if they could afford one or not. And so that's what we'd like to show everybody today is that you can afford one. Now I have uh, got this great uh, opportunity that Rob has been able to let me offer to everybody today. And it is getting your first month of the C getting a CP CFO for free. Now with my calculations, I calculated that an app, uh, a dental assistant makes about ten dollars an hour. Well, you can have a CFO, an, an Adam in your back pocket, or a Steve James in your back pocket, for one third the cost of a, an assistant if an assistant was ten dollars. Uh, so, with that in mind, we would love to show you what we could do. We would love to show you how a CFO, uh, or even if a CFO, can help you in your practice. So, call me or text me by midnight tonight and you will get uh, your first month of a CFO for free. No gimmicks, no no contracts, no no wool between your eyes. This is a, a risk free opportunity uh, just like just like joining on to uh, this webinar today. Uh, it is a risk free opportunity of getting your first month for free. Uh, so my cell phone number is there. It's 801-380-7070 and uh, we will also waive that setup fee for you uh, if there is a what's setup your, fee. What's your email, Curtis? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, it's Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S, at ProCoreCPA.com. Uh, and hopefully you have that as well. But once again, that's Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S, at ProCoreCPA.com. But once again, a, a two-clap for all of the wonderful information that we got today. Uh, Steve was awesome, and so was Adam. Rob, you brought some great points to the table, uh, but we would love to offer this uh, free month, risk-free uh, CFO for you. Uh, so please feel free to give me a call by midnight tonight. Uh, anything else you want to add there, Rob? No. Uh, you know, I'm, I am a little disappointed that we, there weren't more things that we could talk about and be able to give more more information of, of things that these practices could do to be able to be more successful. So um, definitely I would take Curtis up on his offer 
to uh, send him a text or email and, and, and have him send the additional things to you. Um, as well as I'd encourage you to take us take you take him up on, on his offer to have a free month of a of a CFO. Yeah, Steve, how would you like a what if your company didn't have a CFO and you were offered a free CFO for a month? Would you uh, would that be something that would interest you? Uh, well, so for all those out there, we'd love to we're, love to show you uh, without any risk, without any obligation, what we can do for you as a uh, a CFO in your dental office. So please, uh, once again, give me a call or text me by midnight tonight, 801-380-7070. Thanks, everybody. We hope you have a great night. Hey, and again, thank you, uh, Adam and, and Steve and, and Curtis, and uh, everybody who's on here be, uh, be watching for our next webinar. Thanks, everybody.